Good. Well, welcome, everyone. Very pleased uh, that you could all be here and honored to have such a distinguished uh, panel and in particular to have the minister uh, with us. Um, it's a great pleasure for the International Growth Center to host uh, this event. Uh, women's economic empowerment and the issues of gender equality are issues that run straight through uh, development challenges. Uh, we work on a wide range of issues, uh, not only in Africa, but also in Asia. And the themes uh, around uh, women's economic empowerment continue to surface as being key to really addressing the key development challenges. As you may know, the purpose of the International Growth Center is to promote inclusive and sustainable growth in developing countries by providing demand-led policy advice based on frontier research. So what we seek to do is to broaden the debate, to bring new ideas, new evidence, fresh approaches to development challenges by finding a new way of bringing together top researchers internationally, so some from the LSE, but some from all over the place, international universities, together with people in government and other stakeholders to try to create new ideas, to sort of rethink the idea generation process as one that actually should be policymakers and researchers working together right from the beginning when we think about what the agenda should be. So what questions should we be asking? Straight through to the research process and the outputs of that research. If we do it all collaboratively with policymakers, with stakeholders, then two things happen. One is there's much more ownership. So policymakers really feel that these are ideas that they've contributed to right from the very beginning. But there's also the potential then working so closely with stakeholders that they can take things to scale. So that things that, if we really do see and, uh, succeed in identifying some new, new approaches, that those can then be taken to scale uh, effectively. Some of the exciting things that we've done in, in, in uh, the area of women's economic empowerment uh, hinge on transitions out of extreme poverty. So we've worked with BRAC, which is the international NGO originally from Bangladesh, which has developed something called the, what they call the graduation programs. And that's something that's based on the insight that often training on its own or cash support on its own just doesn't seem to work. And what this program does is to bring those two things together. So to give women in extreme poverty an asset, which might be livestock or it might be a sewing machine, and then to give them the training they need to be able to get the economic value out of that asset. And what we've shown in the evaluations that we've done over not just three years, but over seven years, is that after seven years, these women graduate out of extreme poverty, that they have a sustained increase in income of about 40%. And what's happened is that we've created an economic opportunity for them, the programs create an economic opportunity that allows them to generate their own income, allows them to then become self-sustaining. In another program, we worked with the government in Bihar, in India, about the problem that women att girls' attendance in secondary school was very low, particularly relative to, to boys. And it turned out there were two big challenges. One was mobility, and the other was security. Working with the government, we identified that providing girls with bicycles was going to address both of these. And again, we did a test to see if, whether the bicycles itself was really making a difference, and it did. And the government then you know, adapt, uh, rolled that, uh, that policy out. The other area I'd like to cite is look, thinking hard about the school to work transition. So how is it that girls can move effectively from school into productive economic activity? And what we found in work both in Uganda and in Zambia is that even small scale interventions which help girls particularly to develop soft skills and life skills, negotiation skills and related things as well as vocation related skills can have a huge difference in their success in engaging then in the labor market. And it does that not only by giving them marketable skills, but by allowing them to negotiate tricky situations in, in other aspects of their life. So we show that girls that get this training have much lower rates of, of uh, pregnancy and much lower rates consequently of, of uh, HIV and, and so forth. So it's changing their lives in a way that makes it possible for them to take control and to move into the labor markets effectively. So these are all things that sort of run through our research that we think are, are, are hugely important. A great pleasure uh, to welcome today the, uh, the minister who's been such a champion 
of many of these issues, both at home and abroad. I can say, I think unusually, the minister has held uh, two different types of very important portfolio in government. On the education side, she was minister for education from 2001 to 2005, and then uh, returned to that portfolio, minister of higher education and science in 2016. But in between from 2005 to 2010, and then again now since uh, 2016, has been uh, Minister uh, for Cooperation, Development Cooperation uh, in, in Denmark. And she's both been a pioneer in terms of ensuring access to education for women, but also in supporting entrepreneurship for women in developing uh, countries and really thinking hard about where are the challenges, where are the bottlenecks that we need to address to really pursue uh, this agenda of, of promoting economic empowerment. Uh, her, her canvas uh, is a global one. She recently led um, action against uh, President Trump's sort of global gag rule on uh, restricting US funds for family planning programs and encourage the EU to step in to really prevent uh, the, the worst effects of that and to find extra resources to fill that gap uh, that uh, had been created. Um, she's been a champion of the She Decides movement um, and promotes, continues to promote women's and girls' rights to make choices about their own bodies and about, uh, and about sexuality. Her background is she has a degree in business administration in English and French from the Copenhagen Business School. She completed her university studies in France in Chambéry and the Faculty of Law at University of Copenhagen. Minister, we're delighted to have you uh, with us today. As, as a global citizen, as a woman and mother, as a minister and politician, I feel very honored to be here today on the eve of the International Women's Day tomorrow. Tomorrow is a day to celebrate the incredible journey millions of women and girls around the world have taken. A journey towards a life in dignity with equal opportunities, freedom, and prosperity. Just imagine, a hundred years ago, for the first time, the British Parliament passed an act granting most women, yet not all, the right to vote. Look at you now. <laughs> the influential women next to me in the panel, and the many female students and eligible voters in this room. What a long way we have come. But the journey is far from over. For many girls and women, the journey has not yet even started. In several parts of the world, gender equality and women's enjoyment of human rights is but a distant hope. And women's rights are even under increasing pressure. Various conservative and religious movements globally are adding pressure. This needs to change. We cannot and should not accept the setbacks we see now. All of us being privileged and resourced strong agents gathered here in this room have a responsibility to act, to stand up and fight for those millions of girls and women who do not enjoy the same fundamental rights as we do. Which challenges am I talking about? What are the setbacks? Why is the fundamental rights of women under pressure? Let me give you some concrete numbers and examples. Worldwide, more than 214 million women lack access to birth control and family planning. Nearly 25 million unsafe abortions are carried out every year. More than 800, 800 women die every day due to pregnancy or childbirth. In conflicts and humanitarian crises, the situation is even worse. 
a young girl in South Sudan is three times more likely to die in childbirth than she is to complete her primary school. And what about equality? This year's gender map report from the World Economic Forum estimates that if we continue business as usual, we are 217 years from reaching gender equality. And the challenges are greatest in the poorest countries of the world. 217 years, that is six to seven generations from now. Data, data clearly underlines that the current situation is unacceptable. We need to change this, and that is a top priority for me, as woman, as mother, and as minister. My vision is that, 20, that by 2030, women and girls, even in the poorest areas of the globe, should have the ability to enjoy their rights, fulfill their potential, and make their own choices in life. This vision also has a crucial role in realizing all other sustainable development goals. And I will use my voice and my influence as the Danish Minister for Development Cooperation. Why choose this as a top priority? It's simple. Because it is the right thing to do. Sexual and reproductive health and rights is a fundamental human right for all women and girls. Every woman and girl should have the right to decide over their own body, including the right to decide with whom to have children, how many, and when to have them, without question. But moreover, it's also the wise thing to do. Just one number. Global GDP will increase by 25% if women were given the same rights and opportunities in the sphere of work as men. Every, everyone stands to gain. How do we make the vision real? How do we create the necessary change? For me, change only come if we create awareness on the importance of gender equality and equal rights, have aspiration for change, and the ability to see change by concrete actions. Most importantly, we need partnerships. Let's focus on the first necessity of change, awareness. Is there global awareness of the gaps and the gains to be made? increasingly. This year, the Davos, the, the Davos meeting put gender equality in the spotlight. The Me Too campaign has triggered increasing public debate. And countless of women and men across the globe are collecting and analyzing data, campaigning and speaking out loud to increase awareness around gender equality and equal rights. We have probably all seen concrete examples of injustices and, and wasted opportunities. Just yesterday, I visited the UNHCR managed camp for mainly South Sudanese refugees in Kakuma, mm -hmm. northern Kenya. The majority in the camps are women and girls having fled horrifying violence and abuse. Yet, the greater part of the girls in the camps are not enrolled for primary education, even though the schools are run by the international community. And in classes with older pupils, there were even less girls. The crucial door to a better life was closed for them. 
we can do better than that. And I intend to see to it. In humanitarian situations, we know that on top of all other problems, women often lack the means to decide over their own body. In Ethiopia, Denmark acts as catalyst for partnership between the World Food Programme and the UNFPA. <coughs> UNFPA uses World Food Programme's access and food delivery points to reach women with family planning services while they obtain food so they don't have to go to another location if there even, if there even is one. This shows the benefit of partnering up with international and, lo and local partners to come up with new and innovative solutions to reach women and girls in order to change the injustices that we are indeed all aware of. The second critical component is the desire for change. This desire I experience in many circumstances. I see and feel it is in this room here today. And across the world, I've met fantastic women and men who work tirelessly for equality and empowerment of women and girls. From the poorest villages in Africa to the highest political levels in the UN. Today is the 10th anniversary for a Millennium Development Goal number goal three campaign that I initiated in my last term as Minister for Development. I handed out more than 140 torches to key persons who were pushing for gender equality. Since then, more and new actors have taken up the torch. I especially applaud all young leaders like you here today who are ready to continue the fight for gender equality. And I hope to hear many of your voices, not only tomorrow, pressing for change, the theme for the International Women's Day, but every day. The new Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, strongly underscores the desire for change. And with the SDG number five, it is recognized that gender equality is both a goal in itself and part of the solution to achieving all 17 goals in partnerships. I strongly believe that we will not manage to achieve the sustainable development goals if we do not address the issue of gender equality. The third component is the ability to bring about change. Today, there is a momentum to see women and girls as a strong resource. 51% of the world's population whose potential, when activated, can bring a boost to the economy, bring new ideas, variety and new perspectives. Let me illustrate with a Danish example. Denmark has come a long way towards gender equality. Pe people often say that, people, people often say this is due to the fact that we are a rich country. I would dare to agree the opposite. That is because of gender equality that we are a prosperous country. For instance, today, Danish women and men are almost equally available for the labor market. 72% women, 76% men. This is good for our democracy, and it's good for the economy. This ability of women to bring about change and, and economic prosperity is a key focus in Denmark's development policy. When women's potential as economic agents is unleashed, women's right Take, take leaps ahead, and it creates a ripple effect for societies. One aspect is to support 
female entrepreneurship and access to capital. Denmark contributes through the, the World Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, the WeFi. Together with the World Bank, President Kim, IMF Chief Lagarde, and Ivanka Trump, to place this aspect high on the agenda for development. Ability to bring about change is also a question of having the ability to leave no one behind. Women and girls with access to education and health services are often married later, have fewer and more healthy children, and become active citizens who contribute to their societies. But in situations of extreme poverty and in humanitarian situations, women and girls are the most prone to be married early, receive no education, and have no access to health. Therefore, Denmark puts particular focus on working through our humanitarian and development policy to reduce women and girls' vulnerability and increase their resilience. Ending child marriage is one aspect hereof. In parts of the world, <coughs> girls at the age as low as nine are being forced to marry to adult men. To me, this is one of the most horrible human rights violations. In fact, child marriage is by many and in my opinion, rightfully, now being framed as child rape. No girl must be robbed her childhood or her education, health and aspirations for the future by, married off, by being married off. I've talked about awareness, desire for change, ability to change, let me conclude by addressing action and partnerships, the most crucially needed to succeed in creating gender equality. We need the collective efforts of all. We need to join forces, civil society, religious leaders, village chiefs, governments, CSOs, private companies, foundations, philanthropists, donors, and UN organizations, banks and pension funds. We need new and unconventional partnerships working around all the aspects of women and girls' empowerment and ability to exercise the fundamental human rights. Let me give you a very concrete example of how action can be taken. One year ago, the Trump administration reinstated the global GAC rule. Denmark, together with a handful of like-minded countries, decided to form the activist She Decides movement, a movement born out of the imminent need as we saw, it's, as we saw it to stand up and speak out against severe setbacks for women's and girls' rights globally. Last week in Pretoria, Denmark and South Africa co-hosted the first She Decides One Year On conference with a special focus on youth. And in Pretoria, representatives from governments, parliaments, civil society, bright academics like you and like, like you here, and notably young people from North and South, all committed to stand up collectively to a vision of a new normal. A new normal where women and girls can decide freely over their own bodies, their own lives, and their own futures, where she decides without question. Action is needed for women and girls, but really to the benefit of all of us. A clever man once said, we need not wait to see what others do. In other words, be the change you want mm -hmm. to see. I will add, together, let's collectively be the change we want to see for women and girls to the benefit of all. Thank you very much.
thank you, uh, Minister, not just for a compelling call to action, but for a roadmap uh, mm -hmm. for how that action uh, might take, take place. Um, now, uh, a pleasure to introduce our moderator. Before I say that, I just want to say the Minister uh, is going to have to leave uh, at about 5 o'clock, so we'll be able to stay for the first part of the panel discussion, but then uh, needs to leave to catch her plane back to, um, to Copenhagen. Uh, we're very grateful uh, to Minister for, for having been able to be with us today. Um, yeah, one uh, sort of housekeeping thing, the hashtag is in front of you. You are encouraged to uh, tweet if you would like to, but I would ask that you keep your phones on silent. This is being recorded uh, for uh, hopeful distribution as a podcast uh, later on. Um, finally, I'd just like to introduce uh, the moderator. Linda Yu is, has many hats. Uh, she's a visiting senior fellow here at LSE Ideas. Uh, she's also a fellow in economics at Oxford at St. Edmund Hall and an adjunct professor of economics at London Business School. Uh, you may have also seen her on TV, where she has presented a number of things and radio uh, of really important series, including The New Middle Class, The Next Billionaires, and Working Lives. So someone who has skills right across uh, the platform. Uh, anyway, it's a great pleasure, Linda, to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jonathan. Um, and um, thank you very much um, to Minister Ola Tornas for such a fantastic um, opening speech, which has gotten me thinking about lots of things, which I'm sure the rest of this expert panel will be addressing. And just to reiterate what Jonathan has said, you're very welcome uh, to tweet. I think part of being taking action is via social media. So take the thoughts that you're hearing today, tweet about it, post it on Facebook, post it on Instagram. We very much look forward to um, hearing all of your uh, social media calls to action after this. Let me just say a word before I introduce the rest of the expert panel about why the IGC is convening this discussion today. I think all of you here know the International Women's Day is a, a terrific um, worldwide event that celebrates uh, women's political and social achievements, but it's also about a call to increasing progress towards gender equality. And I think specifically with the new SDGs the minister has mentioned, um, SDG 5 is about achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls to realize their full potential. And I think it's particularly poignant this year. We have obviously um, had quite a year in terms of um, seeing a global movement emerging around um, women's rights, equality, and justice. All the instances of sexual harassment and discrimination, I think, um, have really um, crystallized the need to not rest on our laurels and realize that a lot more needs to be done if women are to achieve an equal place in society. Um, given this is the LSE, we must focus on the economics. <laughs> and um, achieving equality um, is also, um, we're going to discuss this, about linking back to economic growth and to development. Um, and um, I will be putting a question uh, to each of the panelists um, to uh, set us off on this task about how we can think about um, the links between improving economic prosperity and the issues of gender. So easy task, we'll be able to manage it in the next hour and a half. We will solve it, um, but with your help, because after we hear from them initially, um, the floor will be open to your contributions and to your questions. Um, and just a couple of uh, links in my own research I thought I would just mention. The, the very first one is that adding women to the labor force uh, has increased economic growth in Western Europe and the United States. Um, by between 12 to 14 percent um, since World War II. And so it is a big driver. That's why Abenomics has adding women um, to the workforce at the same rates as men as one of the pillars, womenomics, to turn around the fortunes of that economy to help. And the second thing, um, some of my work in economic development, this is, um, this is uh, something which has been found in field work across developing countries, which is if you give women um, female-headed households income, um, they spend it on education and on clothing for their children. 
If you give it to male-headed households, they spend it on cigarettes and alcohol. <laughs> Um, there's a lot more, I think, to discuss. Let me, without further ado, welcome the rest of this expert panel to tackle this very challenging topic. Um, firstly, I'd like to introduce to my right Her Excellency Janice Charette. She's the High Commissioner for Canada to the UK for Great Britain and Northern Ireland. A warm welcome to you. Um, and then to her right is Manu Shafiq, who is the director, all of you will know, of the LSC. I don't think I need to introduce her, really. Um, and then to my left is Dorcas Erskine. She's the director of policy, advocacy, and programs at ActionAid. So let me kick off with Janice. Um, I want to uh, first give her um, a bit more of an introduction. Um, Janice assumed her responsibilities as the Canadian High Commissioner uh, to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland um, in September 2016. Before this, she was a clerk of the Privy Council and Secretary to the Cabinet from 2014 to 2016, where she served as the Principal Public Service Advisor to the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Prime Minister Stephen Harper, as well as the head of the public service. Now, the Canadian government announced in June of last year a 2.8 billion pound annual aid plan for the next five years. Much of it is directed towards uh, women's organizations um, in the global south and was very much welcomed um, as a foreign aid strategy. 95% uh, of Canadian foreign aid is committed to criteria specific to women with the goal of empowering and improving the health and well-being of girls and women and their children. So Janice, um, can I um, ask you, what does this new approach to supporting women's rights entail and how will focusing can Canada's international assistance on the full empowerment of women <laughs> and girls contribute to this very um, key goal of inclusive growth in the world? Thank you very much, uh, Linda, and uh, thank you to, uh, to our friends here at LSE and the International Growth Center for inviting me to be part of this fascinating panel and, a, and an important week. Um, I think uh, I'm going to key off of actually some of the things the minister said, uh, because I think that Canada's new feminist international assistance policy, which is the policy announcement that you're referring to from June of last year, um, really represents a response to that rising awareness uh, and the desire for change being translated into the ability to make change and therefore driving into partnerships and collaboration. So um, our Minister for International Development, Marie-Claude Bibeau, um, was asked by the Prime Minister to review all of Canada's international assistance with a view to figuring out how we could really focus our resources um, as you would predict, given you know, the direction set globally by Agenda uh, 2030, given the directions under the SDGs. So how can we best use our resources to be able to actually try and help the world's poorest and most vulnerable? And uh, the government launched a uh, very significant consultation exercise, both within Canada but also consulting our international friends and allies. And what, uh, what became of that consultation exercise was the new feminist international assistance policy, a decision by the government that in order to really make the kind of changes that, uh, and make the kind of contribution Canada thought it should uh, to these global challenges, that the way forward was really through the empowerment of women and girls. And so our entire international assistance budget, which is the amount you described, so it's about uh, five billion, just over five billion dollars Canadian, or three billion pounds sterling on an annual basis, um, is uh, is now being put through the lenses of this feminist feminist international assistance policy, FIAP, they call it, but I'll try to av avoid the acronym since it's meaningless. Uh, so I think. Um, obviously, uh, international assistance uh, it tends to be a combination of some very short-term but also some long-term investments. So it will take some time for the entire stock of this investment to roll over to be fully reflective of, of this new direction. Uh, but I can assure you that every single incremental discretionary dollar that comes forward at this point in time is really assessed against the lenses of the feminist international assistance policy. It has a number of themes associated with it. One of, it is, one of those is ex uh, 
uh, explicitly about how do we foster inclusive growth strategies that are actually going to uh, assist with this and support the empowerment of women and girls in the economic space. And there we see investments in things like skills training, that transition from school to work that the minister spoke about. Uh, but also I think beyond that, how do we support women uh, to have access to the decision-making processes by which actually some of these economic rights are conferred? How do, we, how do we remove barriers for women to participate in the economy, for example, in those countries right now where there's a bar on women owning property? How can we actually work to remove those kinds of legislative barriers so that uh, so that that, uh, that uh, opportunity is available to them? One of the areas where we have consistently uh, provided support is in uh, in agricultural uh, development, whether it's technical cooperation or actually uh, support to farmers. Uh, and we've had a program uh, come forward now in South Sudan where the exclusive focus is going to be on trying to assist women farmers to actually have access and to be able to um, uh, use that uh, agricultural land in order to grow food and crops both to feed families but all, and communities but also uh, as an economic uh, product. So that's one of the areas that's explicit but I think actually it's important to look not just at that inclusive growth pillar but also at some of the other pillars whether it's uh, the pillar around uh, human dignity and so I think, the, for example, the, the, uh, uh, the work that we're doing around sexual reproductive health is about making, giving women uh, the power to make choices which will allow them as well to, uh, to participate in the economy uh, and not necessarily, uh, not have that as a, as a challenge to them. Uh, to be able to deal with the, uh, I think, the crisis that the minister spoke about in child early and forced marriage, where we have people whose lives are really being taken away from them at such an early age, and they're put on a path where they don't have access to education, they don't have access to to participate in uh, in their communities, in their economies, in a way that otherwise might um, might unleash their potential to contribute, uh, both for their families, but also more broadly for the economy. So I think those are just a couple of examples. Um, and I think that that's very responsive. I, I had a chance to look at the Secretary General of the United Nations put out his statement for International Women's Day. And he quoted in there, achieving gender equality and empowering women and girls is the unfinished business of our time and the greatest human rights challenge in our world. So I think that what Canada, what we're trying to do with our feminist international assistance policy is really aligned there. There's a few other elements of it, whether it's in the environment and climate change uh, front, uh, whether it's in the peace and security area, uh, inclusive governance, but I'm not, gonna, uh, I'm not gonna go into those. We can do that in the questions if you wish. One of the things I just wanna mention, uh, my last point, is that the SDGs are not just about the developing world. They're also about the developed world. And Canada's in no position, as are many other developed countries. Not, we are not in a position to be able to declare victory on full empowerment of women and girls and gender equality in Canada. That's, of course, uh, the case for uh, women of uh, visible minority, Aboriginal women and girls, but it's also the case for, uh, for, uh, for uh, many other women and girls in our society. And so it's interesting, I think, one of the things that Prime Minister Trudeau, using his leadership, his voice, has, has, has drawn on his gender equality cabinet, um, is really to drive that that whole notion about empowerment of women and girls, gender equality, gender empowerment across the agenda. You'll see that reflected in how Prime Minister Trudeau will bring forward the themes for the presidency of the G7 this year. And so when leaders meet in the beautiful Charlevoix in, uh, in Canada in June, those themes will be reflected, not just as a afternoon session on gender equality, but it'll be woven across foreign policy, trade policy, across all of, of what the Prime Minister will be talking about. You'll see Canada bringing forward in our progressive trade agenda, which is a domestic priority, um, things like putting a gender chapter in our trade agreements, which we've done now with Chile, for example. So how can we make sure that barriers to women entrepreneurs are removed in our trade agreements? So just a couple of examples of how, within the domestic agenda, we're trying to address the same priorities that we are for our feminist international assistance policy and actually respond to the kind of challenges and the data that we heard so far today. 
Thank you very much, Janice. Um, I loved your Prime Minister's response when he was asked about his gender equal cabinet. Um, uh, he was asked, um, why is your cabinet gender equal? And the answer was, because it's 2016, move on. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> okay, let me now turn to Manoush uh, Shafiq. Manoush became the youngest vice president in the history of the World Bank at the age of 36. She joined the International Monetary Fund in 2011 as deputy managing director with responsibility for many of the crisis countries in the Eurozone and the Arab countries in transition from 2014 to 17. She was deputy governor of the Bank of England, responsible for a balance sheet of nearly half a trillion pounds and sat on all the bank's major policy committees. So Manoush, gender equality is both a moral and an economic imperative but we've heard um, the challenges are still very much with us today. In 2017, um, according to the World Economic Forum's gender report, the gender gap had increased in 82 out of the 142 countries which they covered. So drawing on your extensive experience, including at uh, DFID, um, in the as part of the UK government, how can developing countries benefit from gender parity and women's economic development? And how are women a driver of global economic growth? Simple questions. Very simple question. Um, well, thank you very much for that question. And it's a real pleasure to be here on the eve of International Women's Day. Uh, let me say something about the macro data, and then I'll say something about the micro data, uh, and then a little bit about policy. So I think the macroeconomic data is very compelling. The minister has already cited the figure that world GDP would be 25% higher if we had uh, gender parity in labor market participation, and a great deal of evidence across the world supports that. The, the, the evidence on female labor force participation is very uneven. Um, I remember when I was at the IMF when we did the first Article 4, which is the annual IMF assessment of an economy for Japan, and gender equality in the labor market was a huge theme. It was the first time the IMF had ever made a big fuss about the fact that Japan's economy was in jeopardy because they weren't using the talents of all of the women in Japan because labor market participation was very low. And if pension schemes in Japan were going to be sustainable, they were going to need more people contributing into pension schemes and having more women working was a key part of the fiscal sustainability for of the Japanese economy. Similar issues were raised in Italy, where again, another country in Europe where female labor force participation is incredibly low. If you look at the developing world, the numbers are very, very low in South Asia and in the Middle East in particular. Uh, and those parts of the world would benefit enormously from po more progressive policies which encouraged women to go into the labor market. I'll say just a brief word about the microeconomic data and then let me talk about policies. The, the microeconomic data, if you look at the firm level, is also equally compelling. Uh, there's been quite a lot of work uh, done on uh, firms, listed firms in the stock market, things, you know, Fortune 500 firms, for example, which have the best record on women tend to be more profitable by a rate of between 18 and 69 percent than the median firm. Firms that have uh, at least one woman on their board have stock prices that are about 26 percent higher than other firms. So even at the firm level, you can show the benefits of greater female participation. And so, of course, the obvious question is, what do you do? Why, how do you get more women into these roles? Now, when I was young, very young, a long time ago, 30-odd years ago, I remember being an undergraduate and writing an essay with the unambitious title of something like, A Feminist Strategy for the World, something like that. You know, the kind of essay you write when you're an undergraduate. <laughs> And I remember my, you know, I'd looked through all the issues that were driving gender gaps around the world. And my view at the, you know, at the ripe age of 17, uh, was education was the panacea. That if we could just educate more and more women, and because education was so correlated with everything else, more educated women tended to go into the labor market, more educated women had fewer children, more educated women had access to contraception, et cetera, et cetera. More educated women got into political power. I thought education was the, the panacea. But the truth is, we now have reached the stage in most places in the world where we have almost gender parity in education. And in higher education, there are now more women in the world in higher education than men. So we have reached a sort of tipping point globally. Uh, and that's true even in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, in countries that you would not think you would have more women in universities than men. 
So education clearly is not enough. Uh, and I think the issue for most developing countries is now moved on from education to facilitating employment. And I think there, the policy agenda is around things like parental leave, around childcare, uh, around banning discrimination in the labor market, uh, and creating more work workplace opportunities for women to tap into that huge amount of talent that we have now invested in all of these educated girls. So I guess that's where I would point to uh, as the kind of the next frontier for gender equality uh, for women in developing countries if we want to maximize their contribution to economic growth. Thank you very much, Manoush. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to now turn uh, to Dorcas um, Erskine. Um, her background is in working as a specialist on preventing and supporting women who have experienced violence, most recently in the Middle East. Amongst other organizations, she worked with Action Aid Tanzania, the International Rescue Committee, and a charity supporting female victims of trafficking. Action Aid has long been unique in supporting and championing the voices and dignity of some of the world's most vulnerable people, particularly women and girls. Um, even though significant progress has been made to put women's rights at the top of the international political agenda, I think it's fair to say there's still some ways to go. So, Dorcas, drawing on your experience working with the most marginalized groups of women around the world, what are the biggest challenges that stop women from being able to access secure jobs and safe working environments free from any source form of violence? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for um, inviting me here on a very distinguished panel. I'm feeling slightly um, nervous um, for two reasons, because you're so distinguished, and I'm going to disagree with you a little bit, which is the nature of civil society, so you should um, be used to it. We welcome debate at the LSE, <laughs> exactly. so you're in good, <laughs> you're at the right place. Uh, I guess, um, you know, I'm not an academic, but uh, I am a... I'm a practitioner and I work a lot. I've worked in many different countries with many different kinds of women. And um, as Manoush was saying, we've always thought of different silver bullets, right? You know, you do impact evaluations and it's maybe if you just like give soap in a school, then um, lots of girls who would not normally go to school because they were sick um, and could come and attend to school and then suddenly the attendance rates go. We have all these silver panaceas, but no one ever talks about the most obvious but most difficult thing to solve. And I think the Canadians are, are getting there um, and definitely as well in Denmark. And it's about patriarchy. It's not rocket science. You're amazing. Oh, I, I see a woman over there, like, you know, she's feeling what I'm saying. Um, so, where, you know, if you're asking me what is the biggest and most difficult um, barrier to, to women um, achieving equality, whether it's economic equality or safety from violence, is this toxic combination of trenchant beliefs about women's place, role, utility, and agency in every society in the world, including our own in the UK. Um, and that is quite a challenge, and that is a, a, a facet of study that um, I would really love such smart minds as yours to really focus on. Um, because it's often a catch-all phrase that no one really disagrees with or people are a bit uncomfortable with because it sounds political. But the thing is, um, women's rights and women's empowerment is political. It's a form of po um, political violence um, against women's economic opportunity. It's very difficult to address all of these issues. I'm sure in a few years' time, you know, we would have like made another um, um, seismic jump um, around a certain amount of progress and we'll still be talking about the same issues, but we need to really address patriarchy to look at how it, um, it manifests. And that's the way ActionAid takes that approach. And I guess that's because we support women's movements, um, and they often call time on our panacea sort of solutions. And we've learned the hard way because we've, we've often applied for, for, for certain um, interventions. We've had like very rigorous, and thank you uh, donors, I think, for being very rigorous around like the evidence base of some of our interventions. And they just are not as effective as they could be, we noticed, when we started to address power. Um, and you can't take that away from the equation. It's so nebulous, so it's very difficult to, to really um, articulate, <laughs> but there is no getting around it. Um, and I guess, um, 
just to put that as a, a sort of um, thin on the table. I guess in answer to your question, the manifestations of patriarchy that um, we see in our work is a big underinvestment in social protection. So social protection is um, the things that women need in order to attend school, in order to have good uh, health care, and um, it's great to have um, this support. But it's also around um, their unpaid care and their co contribution to the economy. It's about the ability or the lack of ability to unionize um, um, in workplaces to address sexual harassment. We have um, what we call rights cafes in Vietnam and Bangladesh outside garment factories that have been going on for years, you know, and um, we're now seeing a, a lot of support now from authorities around the benefits of these sort of factories. But we were doing this before it was very popular around um, fair trade clothing. Um, but women weren't allowed to unionize. They weren't allowed to demand their rights. There wasn't a voice for them. So um, those are the basics that we need to get right, and they're often the really more difficult things to sell. They're not the things that are easy or tangible to do, but then we, we waste money if we ignore patriarchy. And then there's the, also the harmful traditional practices, so, um, which is a, a key part of um, my, my work, which, um, whichever part of the globe I work in. And that's a very difficult conversation as well because you get into tricky conversations about cultural relativism, you get into conversations around uh, rights, but the fact of the matter is, um, um, as most women's groups would tell you and as most feminists would tell you, the personal is political. So if women aren't able to control their bodies, if they aren't able to say no to violence, they're not really going to progress economically in the workplace. So in ActionAid, we no longer see women's economic empowerment as one strand and violence against women as another and women's voice as another. They are intersected. So um, I would really challenge that kind of inquiry um, in terms of how we approach this topic. But thank you again for having me. Thank you, Dorcas. Well, you are, you are definitely at the right place because the full name of the school is the London School of Economics and Political Science. <laughs> we don't do one without the other. Um, I know the minister um, has, to, um, has to leave. Um, would you uh, but be able to can, give a Can quick? I just yes, of course, uh, say yes. that I, I might be using other words than my uh, colleagues sitting next to me, but, uh, but our goals are the same. And, and you're saying that things are interlinked. I fully agree with you. And this is why the issue of, of, of gender equality is a cross-cutting issue. And, and, and that's also why I say again and again and again uh, that we will not manage to achieve the, million, the, sorry, the sustainable development goals if we do not address what you are exactly are saying about harassment, about sexual abuse. This is so linked to uh, the possibilities of, econ of economic empowerment of women. So yeah, I agree with you, even though I might use some other wordings if I want to uh, have uh, very, very, very important people to listening to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be part of, 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 of this uh, conference and unfortunately I have to run to catch my plane, so I would just like to wish you a very good and fruitful debate thank for the you. run. Thank, thank you. you so much, thank you. Well, um, thank you very much uh, to the Danish minister when she said that Denmark is not, um, it's not gender equal because it's rich, it's rich because of gender equality. I think that's given us uh, quite a good uh, starting point um, to rethink the links between gender equality and economic prosperity. Um, so now, um, I'm just going to um, uh, engage the panel um, in a brief discussion and then we'll just quickly open it up to, to all of you. But I just wanted to, um, ask each of the panelists, in terms of the concrete steps that you would most like to see um, taken to ensure that we can advance this agenda. So I know there's obviously quite a lot, um, even though Manish, you did have the answer when you were an undergraduate to the, um, but I think it would be, it'd be, I'd be curious to hear two or three concrete steps that 
you would like to see now being done to advance the gender equality agenda? And obviously, we will discuss um, much more broadly um, the in interconnected issues. But I would just be curious to know what you think of as the, what you would like to see immediately coming up. Um, can I um, start uh, with Janice? Thank you. <laughs> um, I hate when they push us for the real concrete stuff. Uh, <laughs> so um, I have two things uh, to say about this. One of them is um, I'm a woman of a certain age. It took me a long time to consider myself and, and think of myself and represent myself as a woman leader. It's a relatively recent development. I was a leader. I didn't want to hear any of this woman stuff, right? Because I didn't think there was any reason to call myself out in that respect. And similarly, I had the same kind of reaction around things like quotas. And uh, I really reacted badly to that. I thought, you know, this, uh, I, I believe in meritocracy and I want to get this job on my own merits and I want to be treated and assessed that way. And you know what? I don't think that anymore. Uh, well, I still want to get the job on my own merits and so on, but um, I now consider myself a woman leader. I present myself as a woman leader because I think I have a responsibility, a leadership responsibility uh, to also be able to encourage other women. Um, and so I'll come back to that in my other concrete suggestion. But uh, on the quota topic, um, I think that uh, as leaders in organizations uh, on the political side, there are things we can do. Maybe we can change them to targets. Maybe we can change them to accountability metrics to get away from the language of quota. But I think that there are easy steps that we can take, for instance, um, in looking at um, a, a panel of candidates or a group of candidates that are coming forward as nominees for a position. There's no reason that there can't be um, uh, an equal number of male and female candidates coming forward for consideration for a position. And I think that there are easy accountability metrics that we can put into uh, performance agreements that we can put into contracts that will actually ask for that. Boards can ask for that. Public sector managers can ask for that. Um, and I think that that's a very concrete step we can take. Um, debatable, but I think that there is uh, a value in things like gender bias or our uh, bias training uh, for people who are involved in staffing boards. I just did a gender-based awareness uh, course myself after many, many years in the public service and uh, I learned things about uh, my, my hidden biases as well, things that I hadn't, obviously they're hidden, so that's why they weren't obvious to me, but it surfaced them and made me think about them. And so before participating in a staffing process or any kind of a, a supervisory process, talent management process, I think that those, that's a mandatory piece of training that could, uh, that could be offered. None of these are silver bullets, I completely agree with Dorcas, there's, I mean, I don't believe in silver bullets anymore. They don't, maybe for vampires, but other than that, um, they don't exist. And so um, I talked to myself as, a, my last point is about uh, women in leadership. And so uh, I exhort all of you in this room uh, who are uh, who are women who um, will be taking on any kind of role in the future that you have a responsibility, as do I, to support other women uh, who are uh, going to be facing professional and personal challenges to support them and not to turn into, there was a great article on the weekend that had a term for them, uh, women who don't help other women deserve a special place in hell, according to Madeleine Albright. I agree with her on that. Um, but uh, don't turn into the one who actually is making it more difficult for your female colleagues, turn into one of the supporters. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderfully inspiring. Uh, Manoush. Yes, it's interesting about quotas. One, um, one of my observations is that younger women always hate quotas, and then you reach a certain age where you've been watching it not happen for so many years, and then you switch. <laughs> and there's a very definite pattern that older women tend to be much more supportive of quotas. 
Um, well, just actually my anecdote there is I chaired um, a gender equality panel at Davos a couple of years ago. Christine Lagarde was for quotas and Sheryl Sandberg was silent. Yeah, exactly. Well, Christine, I used to work with Christine and um, I watched her make that evolution from someone not believing in quotas to yeah. someone who kind of just got fed up and said, we need quotas, this isn't going fast enough. It's the, I think the minister referred to the 217 years of business as usual if we just carry on like this. I mean, in terms of concrete things, I mean, I think the, the agendas are slightly different for developing countries than in, and then in developed countries. I think for developing countries, economic rights are, are really the, for me, I think the, the next frontier. And by economic rights, I mean banning discrimination in the workplace, employment rights, giving women much more control over their own incomes through microfinance, through the ability to have bank accounts. I, I, think, there's, I think that agenda is, uh, is key for, and again, these things are all interconnected. Women who have their own incomes are much more able to leave an abusive relationship, are much more able to protect their own children, are much more able to exercise autonomy in a whole variety of domains. So I think economic rights in developing countries are, are really critical. I think in most developed countries, um, you know, the basic, in most countries, I'm speaking very generally here, the basic rules and laws are kind of there. Most employers, most decent employers will have rules on the book which say we are equal opportunity employers. Most good employers will do things like have diversity targets and they will promote uh, training and they will do, uh, they'll have parental leave and all those sorts of things that you expect as a sort of good standard. And so I think the, the agenda in many advanced economies or in developed countries has has shifted to the much more subtle issues around, um, around people liking to hire people who look like themselves and having that be really comfortable. And I've worked in a lot of organizations where that's the case. Um, and I think speaking much more openly about that is, uh, is the only way to, to break through that. Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge, I mean, I think the evidence is very clear. If you look at all of the research, diverse teams make better decisions. And I've seen studies on all sorts of domains which show very clearly more diverse teams make better decisions. But there's also research that shows that more diverse teams are a little uncomfortable in the beginning. Um, and people have to work hard to get to, to, to learn how to work with people who are very different than them. But once they overcome that difficulty, the outcome is much better. And I think it's okay to start having honest conversations about, gee, it is a little bit difficult in the beginning, but it's worthwhile in the end. And, and moving toward eliminating that subtle bias, which I think is what is thwarting progress in, 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 in many domains in, in developed countries uh, is key. And to the extent one can move toward gender blind hiring, uh, the better the more applications have no names and no photographs on them, the better. Uh, and to do everything we can to eliminate that very subtle bias that we all carry through socialization throughout our lives. Thank you very much. Um, very, yeah, terrific insights. Um, Dorcas, your concrete steps. <laughs> Michael, you're afraid I'm going to go off on another. Um, no, 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 please. Like I said, <laughs> you know, joking, wonderfully joking. inspiring as I'm well. Joking. So, <laughs> just being mischievous. Um, I, I guess um, for us in uh, Action Aid, like one of the, the, the biggest um, uh, barriers that we, we see is really, um, and I'm quite, being quite um, honest around that, we have invested um, with. Uh, uh, the Netherlands, like quite a, a strong program on measuring women's unpaid care mm -hmm. um, and really working with um, um, governments in Africa and in Bangladesh around like, you know, how to quantify that and then how to look at social protection policies because this is the, the biggest barrier for, for most of the women. So anytime we have a women's economic empowerment program, even if we have like a really good one with a private sector um, company in, a, in an innovative partnership in a factory 
we can't really break past their economic empowerment until we deal with their unpaid care. Mm -hmm. So we've been um, doing timeshare diaries now for nearly three years in about five different countries, and then bringing ministers together to really look at whether the, the state has taken into account the unpaid care and then investing in the sort of childcare policies that are needed. That which brings us into quite nebulous uh, political spaces around uh, gender budgeting, around taxation. Um, and so that's the kind of space that we're in. And we think that there needs to be more attention paid, I think, um, by donors. And lots of donors are doing this already to pressure um, a lot of uh, governments in the South to look at um, their fiscal policies, how they spend, how they gender budget, and then how that's made accountable to, um, to various community groups. And that brings me to uh, another thing, um, which I think a lot of donors are moving um, to, and uh, Canada is definitely a leader in this, is that it's really funding local grassroots organizations, um, you know, to create these accountability mechanisms. So, I mean, it's not really in favor of me um, working in a big INGO, so I'm like sort of um, arguing against my own <laughs> economic interests. But, um, you know, it really is the best way It's not like this is being recorded or anything. <laughs> you know, tweet it out. I think I'll probably do my job tomorrow, yeah. but it's okay. Yeah. But this is sincerely what, what we believe. You, you do need a, um, a local accountability mechanism. And we've done this in other forms of governance, you know, where we, we sort of break down what we expect um, a community to get in terms of... Um, um, uh, local spend around schooling, around hospitals, and we do lots of community-based, um, you know, budgeting and accountability, but we haven't really drawn that down to women's rights organizations because often they don't have the resources. Um, I think on average, um, a study showed that uh, most of them have like an, um, an annual um, budget of $20,000, um, which is nothing. Um, and so they're, 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 it's really hard to get their voices, and when you don't have voice and you don't have visibility, you don't count in terms of those kind of um, budget allocations. And because of the space we're in, we really look at sort of social protection and, and spend, um, and definitely around taxation. And we're also really concerned around certain investment um, policies and decisions. So we, we have like quite a good partnership with uh, the Vietnamese and Bangladeshi government around looking at issues such as this in terms of how they take foreign direct investment, how they look at property rights, which is really um, quite um, an important issue for us. And I think we would like a lot more support, um, you know, for more governments around the world, particularly now as Britain goes into a brave new Brexit world. Um, and has um, interesting trade policies. We wouldn't like a sort of race to the bottom around some of these things. So these are where we're mm. coming from in terms of concrete. Thank you. Oh, yeah, something. of course, yeah. Sorry. Um, just to, to uh, build on what uh, Dorcas was saying, I'm not an international development specialist, uh, but uh, one thing that I think is an interesting uh, connection with what you were saying, which also is in the uh, new feminist policy, of the government is funding women's organizations, but funding them uh, not just uh, for that purpose, um, requiring that uh, any of our aid partners who are involved in programming with us have a mandatory requirement to involve women in the design of programming, involve women in the implementation of the programming, involve women in the evaluation of the programming. And I think that that's uh, and you need to fund organizations that can't do it without some existing funding in it. But I think that that's a really interesting dimension uh, and manifestation of what you're talking about as well. Maybe I just might pick up on the theme about women's unpaid care. Uh, two weeks ago here at the LSE, we had a, a research festival called Beverage 2.0, where we were looking at rethinking the welfare state for the 21st century. And one of the key themes is that Welfare states have, historically have been built on the assumption that women will take care of the very young and the very old, and that care would be unpaid. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it has been constructed. Certainly when Beveridge constructed his welfare state, that was the assumption. Uh, and part of the transition we need to make is to move toward a situation where either that work is remunerated or the state provides support so that the very young and the very old are supported through taxation, and so that women are given equal opportunities to participate in the labor market. Thank you. Um, before I open this up to the audience, just on a personal note, Dorcas, where do you stand on quotas? 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, exactly. Science again suggests that I'm in favor of them. I, I guess, um, you know, and I, ca I can understand, um, I can pretend to understand um, people's um, discomfort with them. Look, um, I, I guess, I, I just feel that progress is too slow um, and that sometimes to, we need to leapfrog um, certain issues. Mm -hmm. um, and often when you've had a lot of power, isn't that the common quote, um, you know, when you lose a little bit of it, it feels like a massive loss. Mm -hmm. But um, I've always found it fascinating, for example, on, for example, on race issues. So if we have like a quotas for for people of color in parliament, and it's maybe like maybe three seats of, out of like 659 <laughs> seats, it's suddenly, oh my God, you know, you're, <laughs> we won't be able as white people to have like, um, a, well, you've got like how many other um, <laughs> 600 and so you, so you see, I, I, I think it's, it's essential and it isn't that much of a um, radical power shift and mm, I don't really okay. think it should be a conversation really, we should just do it and get on with it. Thank you. Actually, under, in behavioral economics, it's called loss aversion. Mm -hmm. So if you've had something and you lose it, it feels much worse mm -hmm. than um, even if it's the same uh, increment of loss um, and the same increment of gain. You feel it much more if you lose it rather than if you gain the equivalent three seats. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So I might take up a course here. Yeah, you should. <laughs> okay, the, the floor is open. Uh, please, um, can you state your name and organization? And I'd be so grateful if you could just keep your questions brief so we could get in as many as possible. I'm going to take them in groups of three. Um, so if you'd like to uh, chip in, um, great. Sometimes in these kinds of uh, settings, I often say, um, I'm looking around for a female hand. I'm happy to say this is not an issue. The first hands that shot up. <laughs> Super. So why don't we start here and then we'll you take these two. Hi, I, my name is Anushna and I'm uh, a student here at the LSE. Thank you for the inspiring views. Uh, so my question is that whenever we have this discussion on gender equality, it is mostly women talking about women to women, even here, majority of us are women. Where do we include men in this discourse? Thank you, great question. Um, maybe Jonathan can answer that. No. <laughs> okay, let's take these two questions. If I can have the mic over here. Hi, uh, my name is Ravina. I'm a postgraduate student here as well. And my uh, kind of question is centered around the theme of violence against women. Um, so, as Joker said, you know, the whole thing about social constructs and this deeply rooted uh, idea of masculinity that is still prevalent in most developing countries. Um, and DFID recently re released a report saying that awareness raising is not effective, it's not working. So how are we going to kind of bridge this gap between changing attitudes and changing behaviours? And so what is, the policy, what is the next policy steps and debates on discourse around, you know, changing these attitudes and kind of, kind of reducing the prevalence rates of violence against women? Thank you very much. And the question here? Oh, okay, we'll come back to you. Yeah, okay. My name is uh, Elizabeth. I'm not from any organisation, and my question is really very similar to the young ladies over there. I think I'm, I can probably safely say I'm considerably older than the young lady over there, and I have never heard a man speaking up for gender equality. Mm, the Prime Minister. And yeah. So my question, re well, that suggests to me actually that most men are not interested in gender equality; that they're actually very happy with things exactly as they are. And so my question is, what um, yes. are you going to do? What are we going to do? What can we do to get men interested in this question? Because I really don't think that many, th mm. that hardly any men are interested in real gender equality. Thank you. There are some men in the audience, if any of them want to chip in <laughs> to answer this question, I actually think let's do it that way. So that's okay. Can I give the mic over to, the, uh, to maybe the gentleman there just to uh, hit these two questions and then we'll turn to the panel. <laughs> hey, this is an interactive session. No. I promised you that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Naeem. I am actually a former LSE student and I now work for the Global Thinkers Forum, which is a non-profit organization which actually works for gender equality and education of young people. Um, and we're actually launching a, a, um, a ranking of the most 40 influential women in the non-profit world, which is going to be published in two years. Don't and I just wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> well, um, 
I think on, on what I want to mention, one, one of the things uh, as a man that I feel personally with regards to, to the whole debate of gender equality is that sometimes we're not sure how to place ourselves with regards to the debate. We don't know how we can contribute to it uh, because we, ha we have this feeling that if we try to promote gender equality as men, it, it might be perceived as, you know, what people call mansplaining, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, that's my favorite. Yeah. There's <laughs> another issue is, um, I think men, as you say, are less interested because they're less affected by it. And I think that for now, uh, you know, they haven't felt the, 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 the impact on women, um, uh, the impact of gender inequality on women. I did because I have a sister and, you know, I, she talks a lot about it, so it's a very personal issue for me. But I think that in the long term, with more campaigning, if with more discussions like this one, and more women talking to their fellow you know, men, friends, and family members, I think men will be more involved. Thank you very much. Um, okay, can I turn to the panel? Um, I'd like to make sure we get in as many questions as possible. So if I could just ask you, um, anyone who would like to take uh, the first uh, and third question is very similar, mm. um, and one person to take the second question. Maybe Dorcas, could you start in the second question, and then I'll come back to you too on, on quick word on, the, on those. Yeah. Sure. I, mean, I, I, I think um, I think I'd say two things. Uh, there was a very interesting uh, movement in the City of London uh, called the Thirty Percent Club, which was pushing to have thirty percent of boards be female, and when they set it up they approached all the older chairmen of major banks in the city who had daughters. And they got to them by their daughters. They basically said to them, you raise these girls. Anyone who's raised children knows, you know, anyone who's raised children is completely baffled. Boys and girls is baffled by patriarchy. Because you look at your daughter and you look at your son and you think, really? I mean, <laughs> anyway, I won't say more than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but so, so that was one strategy which I thought was interesting is go for the, you know, the older men in power who have daughters who would hate to see their daughters treated differently than their sons. The other thing I'd say is go for the really young men because I think young men these days have grown up in a, in a different world and many of them don't want to be the traditional breadwinner who has sole responsibility for earning income for the family and having a wife at home. That's just not the world they grew up in nor the world they want to be a part of. Uh, you know, many of the young men I work with now, they want to take paternity leave and not just two weeks. They want to take several months and enjoy their children when they're young. Uh, and I think, I think those young men are, for me, one of the most hopeful things because I think their attitudes will be very, very different and they will become, I don't even think they're going to have to become advocates. I think it will just emerge naturally that their expectations of how they're expected to behave and how they behave vis-a-vis -vis women will will change. Um, I think this is one, if, if women talking to women could have fixed this, we would have fixed it a long time ago. So um, this is a conversation where we also have to be open uh, and uh, inviting uh, both genders into the conversation and people of all identities into this conversation because I think it's about unlocking human potential and realizing that diversity is a strength and that includes gender diversity as well as other manifestations of diversity. Um, I was sitting at a very fancy pants event uh, in the city and I was having a chat with a, a woman on my left about uh, the gender pay gap and there was a one of these chaps from the city on the other side and so he kind of came into the conversation and I said, oh, we're talking about the gender pay gap. And I went on and I literally, he turned away like this. <laughs> so it happens, right? So I think that the challenge is, and that's maybe if I sat next to a woman, she might have done that too. But um, it, the reality is you have to find your way in. Um, and uh, there, are, there are men who talk about this. Uh, our prime minister talks about it a lot. Our finance minister not necessarily seen to be one who would be inclined in this direction just brought He's an forward. LSC alumni, uh, I yes, say. I should say, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's what happened to him, actually. He just brought forward uh, a budget which was uh, GBA plus, plus, plus. 
uh, budget, so gender-based awareness tested budget uh, with gender budgeting built right into it. Every element of the budget was put through a gender lens. So it is happening in some places, but um, like in all culture change, you have to celebrate the victories um, and don't dwell too long on the losses, and hopefully we can get momentum going in the right direction. Thank you. Dorcas? Sure. So your question was really about um, how to change attitudes because norm change isn't happening. That's really difficult to say because norm change takes a long time. So I'm not sure that we can definitely say that all our efforts around awareness raising have come to naught. But um, I think that what it is a problem is impunity. That's the problem. So I think um, you know we've done really well on awareness raising, maybe on protection and recovery, but we've really done badly on access to justice. Yeah, okay. um, and so there's a culture of impunity. So we do really you know really good community-based programming where you say, oh, don't rape people, um, don't rape women, don't rape girls, please don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> But then it's, we don't have really good accountability mechanisms in all countries. Um, we have, a, I guess we globally have a justice deficit. I mean, it's not just happening in developing countries, it's happening here as well. When you um, look at how women feel when they um, interact with the justice system. And so I think we have like quite a lot of, um, we don't have enough stick in development, but then we are not state actors. So those of us who are sort of doing all the awareness raising or doing all the recovery services, we're not the police services, we're not the ones making um, decisions around that. But what we do do, um, most of us who work in this work, and this is not just unique to ActionAid, that we do empower lots of what we call community paralegals, or what I call in program language when I'm um, talking to my teens, it's like, find the nosiest woman in the village. <laughs> the nosiest woman in the village who knows about everyone's business. She's going to be our community paralegal because then we train her in basic forensic um, um, science. We train her in basic laws. And so when the policeman comes and say, Asha, what happened to you? What, 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 why, why are you bothering me? And like, yeah, 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 I don't need to collect that. She said, well, actually in article 2567, you're supposed to do that. Asha, shut up, woman. You know, <laughs> that, that, and th those mechanisms mechanisms work, you know, they're not a panacea, but they give a sense in the community that they, there, there's no impunity. So these groups in ActionAid are either called women's watch groups or they're called combat groups, um, you know, and that, that's purposeful. We didn't give them those names. That's what the community, the women's uh, groups decided to call themselves combat. That's their own business. But I guess it tells you how they feel about it. The other thing is like, which isn't very comfortable for us as uh, development actors, but there's no way around it, is sometimes you have to make really unlikely bedfellows within certain parameters. So you do have to work with religious leaders. You do have to work with um, sometimes community justice systems because there's nothing there. But then you have to have really clear parameters on how you're doing it like, to make sure that you're not sort of, you know, bringing or reinforcing certain bad justice systems. But we do, there's no way around it. I don't think it's, uh, a problem of awareness raising that isn't working. It's just that we have a justice deficit and we need to take that a bit more seriously. Thank you. Um, I promise I'll come to you uh, for the, uh, the microphone. Um, is over here. Okay, so if I come here and then I'll take the one um, in the back. Um, so here first, please. Thank you. Um, my name's Sarah, I'm also a postgrad student um, in the European Institute. Uh, just kind of following on from the thread that seems to have kind of picked into people's imaginations about this kind of idea of masculinity and, and men's role, um, as much as I fully, fully agree with everything that we're talking about, obviously being here at the LSE and the kind of the ultimate goal of, of getting women into the labour market and such, I read a statistic last week that every single week two women are killed by um, a domestic partner and over the last six years, that amounts to 900 women in the UK alone. So I dread to imagine the statistics in other places. Um, don't you think that we should really be focusing on, as we've talked about previously, rewiring men's perspective, boys' perspective, how we teach boys how to treat women? Because clearly there's, ev there's evidence and, and women can't live, let alone work mm. um, in this country, let alone in other countries. Do you, do you not think that that is the the kind of the more important 
point that we need to focus on rather than looking towards the, the hopeful kind of standard of growth and, and economic policy. Thank you. And we'll pick up the question at the back of the room um, and then I'll, I'll come in front here. There. Okay. I will. I promise I'll get as many as I can. If we can try and keep these brief, I'd be so grateful. Your name and uh, first. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for sharing with, uh, with us your insights into this topic. My name is Matilda and I'm a biomedical student from the University of Westminster. And actually, a couple of weeks ago, I was at Canada House at an event for women leaders in STEM yeah. for gender okay. equality in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And my question today is, how can women in STEM contribute to, the, um, to this path of economic growth? What can we do and how will we contribute to this? Super, thank you so much. Um, there was a question which was submitted to me before the panel began, so I think I should um, throw that into the mix at the moment. So this, this question came from Nuno Perez Costa. Um, name one right awarded to men by law in any Western country that is not awarded to women versus name one right awarded to women by law in any Western country that is not awarded to men. Okay, so um, these, are the, uh, <laughs> these are the questions. Um, looking to the panel to uh, who would like to pick up uh, which one? Um, Dorcas, I think. Let me start with you, maybe the first question. Why not masculinities? Um, let's do that. <laughs> um, um, well, you know, <laughs> So um, I'll, I'll tell an anecdote, and then maybe you can figure out like the answer to that because I'm still a little bit stumped. So um, I was a, a technical advisor, um, and uh, you know, around uh, violence against women in emergencies. So one of the things I have to do is like um, check that when we're in a humanitarian crisis, and this was with another agency. So I was in um, Myanmar, and I was in a, a camp with. Uh, um, with a lot of Rohingya um, get women and uh, girls, and my team in in country had had decided that like the best use of the resources, even though there was a lot of uh, violence um, against uh, girls in the camp, was perhaps to like transfer quite a significant amount of it to deal with like issues of masculinity. So they had formed this um, really innovative, as they thought, um, men's learning circle where they were having conversations about how the men felt about gender equality. Um, and the men decided in the camp that what they would do is like they would have a play um, where they would talk about certain issues um, around gender equality. So we gave them apparently some of um, this money. They put on this amazing play. Um, everyone was there, but all the women were watching in from the outside. So, you know, there was a little hut and all the men were inside enjoying themselves, talking about their masculinities, and the women were watching on the outside. That's a bit flippant, but this is what happens when you take that logic into an actual development program when it's not really tested. Because dealing with masculinities is quite a, um, a, an extensive and expensive practice. So I don't think it's because um, donors or development agencies don't want to do it, but if you're in a camp and you've got lots of people, women and girls who've been raped, and you need to give them direct services, what's happening is like it's often a competition between the two. There shouldn't be a competition of victimhood, but that's just the, the fact of the reality in, in development programming. Um, and um, I know a very good programming um, uh, model on engaging men in accountable practice, um, which had been um, pioneered by IRC and uh, George Washington University. Very, very good program, but it's very expensive. No one's going to fund that. So, uh, um, you know, I'm in a very difficult situation where I have to choose between addressing a systematic problem, and you're right, that's where the problem is, and then saving, like, you know, I have maybe in an emergency or a rape crisis uh, situation in a humanitarian thing, maybe t um, 48 hours to make sure that, like, you know, a woman doesn't have, like, a pregnancy that she doesn't want or have HIV, and those things really ex are expensive, and that's the reality. Often a lot of the male engagement work in development modality is taken from existing funding for women and girls. And that's my problem with it. So I totally agree with you, but just ask people to give more money, yeah? 
that would be good. On that point, Janice, no. <laughs> let's, uh, let's try and tackle the other two questions if we could. Um, one of you like to take the STEM women and the other one perhaps on the rice. STEM. I'll try STEM. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you for the commercial. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we at Canada House have been trying to do and will continue to do a variety of women in leadership kinds of sessions looking at sectors. We've done women in the justice sector and we've done women in STEM and we'll have more to come so watch this space. Um, and uh, I think that you know women in STEM what we're trying to do is, is work from the premise that uh, women in science, technology, engineering, math, um, the more we can, it's, it's Part of the whole conversation we've been having, increasing uh, labor force participation uh, by women in these sectors can have a role, whether it's in a pure economic sense in the macro numbers that, uh, that we heard about earlier, or whether it's in actually the, the direction of travel or the area of discovery that people may be, may be working on. So uh, maybe that uh, maybe a woman cancer researcher may be interested in trying to find a breast cancer research as opposed to some other dimension. So there may be, um, I think that the, uh, those are kind of the um, secondary benefits in my mind though. For me, it really is an economic empowerment argument. And so the more we have uh, women in those occupations, the more those are high value occupations. They drive high, higher salaries that's uh, good economic activity, that's good family salaries, uh, so it's both macro and micro benefits, and that's, I think, really what the, uh, what the goal behind that session was, was just to try to remove some of the, what seemed to be mostly cultural barriers, uh, rather than any kind of uh, institutional or, or uh, regulatory barriers to that space. Just quickly on that, um, there was a hashtag um, which you might be able to, I think maybe it worked for STEM too, but there was a hashtag on Twitter called uh, hashtag what an economist looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I got co-opted into doing that. Oh, yeah. And I think it's just partly what you're describing, Janice. And I think, um, so perhaps something, what does, um, what does a STEM professional look like? Um, so it is about tackling some of those unconscious bias maybe um, and a bit of uh, role modeling beyond um, in a kind of, I think, lighter touch way. So, mm. any? so this is a tricky question of what rights were given to women and not to men and vice versa. But I did come up with a couple of examples. Oh, brilliant. So uh, rights awarded to women which are not awarded to men. So maternity leave. Uh, and even in countries that have paternity leave, maternity leave is usually far more generous, except for in the United States where there is zero legal entitlement to maternity leave, which is... Yes, and no leave for anyone. <laughs> for anyone, it's equal for everyone, but in most countries, women are entitled to more maternity leave than men are entitled to paternity leave. And the other issue is retirement ages. In many countries, women are given lower, are allowed to retire at an earlier age than men. So those are ones given to women, not to men. And then ones awarded to men or the, rather than women. I mean, the one thing, example I came up with was taxation in the United States. Uh, the way second earners are taxed is discriminatory in the US and, and women tend to be second earners. Uh, and uh, in contrast, say in the UK, where everybody is just taxed as an individual. And so you file your tax as an individual and there's no discrimination on the basis of whether you're married or not, or whether you are a male or a female. Whereas in practice, the way the US taxes, it tends to discriminate against women. Great, thank you so much. Those are my um, two examples. Let's gather through more questions. I know there's so many um, here. Uh, I think the lady back there caught my eye, and then I just, I wanna come to this bit of the room. So one here, um, and then one here, and then I'll go to that section um, in the next round. So um, we are running really tight on time. So again, as brief as possible, I'd be so grateful. Thank you. I'm actually in STEM as well, but currently working in the construction industry, which is highly male dominated. And we, this week is totally in boil and turmoil. And we were at the RIBA, which stands for the Royal Institute of British Architects yesterday with exactly the same discussion. And the public was exactly the same, like sort of a lot of women. But the discussion was actually led by one of the main uh, magazines um, uh, in the UK called the Design that is uh, design. Uh, um, yeah, you probably know. So, um, so my question is regarding the board and men at all other levels as well. Uh, so, how you guys coming from the school of economics and social and you know, um, how do we get this message 
across to actually, I, I think you, you mentioned something about, Manush, about targeting the partners who actually have daughters mm -hmm. or, you know, right? mm -hmm. but how do we get them to actually, even the partners who have son, sons and, you know, to buy into this and to actually engage in this discussion and consider it. Our board is eight people and eight males. So, um, and the second one is, my second question is, like, well, to show the Excel spreadsheet to them, look, it's worth it. And it's not only about the society that's worth it, but it's also number-wise. And also, uh, how to communicate the message to the men from the lower levels to the mid to, you know, so they don't get scared of all the motion that's happening, th particularly this week in the UK, uh, with the published, you know, 250 employees companies. Like, how do you get them not to think like, oh, all these women, they are going to take my place. Like are to, you know, also support us. Like. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's come to, um, I think here. Um, oh, it's got, why don't you, you've got the mic, so you go ahead and then we'll come here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, is it work? Hi. Hi. <laughs> My Hi. name is Soyan Kim and I'm a student at King's College London. Um, uh, my question is about the sexist language because we started to um, aware um, avo to avoid using the sex language, such as like you guys, something like this. So I think well, I I'm believe originally from Texas. We say y'all, <laughs> so it's nice and gender <laughs> neutral, I guess. Yeah. So I believe the all the hidden bias of gender yes. is start. It, yeah, it started from the language which okay. we use in daily life. So I want to ask, what do you think about this kind of movement? and okay. what do you think about the sexist language. Thank you very much. Okay, and then the question here, um, the, uh, the mic is coming around. Well, just talking a, li a little bit about intersectionality, like, <laughs> how can we make like feminism inclusive for all? Because it's not the same to be a white woman than a color woman living in the UK or living in, a, in wherever. So yeah, just wanted to talk about a little bit about that. Okay, how to make feminism more inclusive for intersexuality. Okay, brilliant. Um, who would like to take which one of um, these? Um, Maybe I'll take the first one. First one for boards, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I've seen many other things that people have tried, so I'll just name a couple. I mean, the, the idea of targeting the ones who have daughters is one. The other is um, some, some organizations have two-way mentoring schemes. So, you know, they always say, oh, you know, get a, get a rising woman a mentor. But also, to be honest, sometimes they need some mentoring. Uh, so, <laughs> so having it be clear that the mentoring is a two-way relationship and that part of the job of the woman who's being mentored is to teach the senior male what it's like to be a woman in that organization and to make to heighten their awareness and sensitivity. So I think that's kind of an interesting model. The other model that has some advocate is what they call sponsorship, where uh, senior men are asked to sponsor a, a younger woman, a more junior woman. And the sponsorship is sort of slightly different in the sense that you're not there just to give advice about their careers. You're actually responsible for making sure this person gets ahead, gets assignments that are you know, challenging, gets visibility in the organization, and so on. Thank you. Okay, Jen, is, we can't really hear. Uh, because in the interest of time, is it okay if we, um, okay, sorry, we've just got, I know we've got so many other hands, and if we can uh, get in one more round, that'd be amazing, so. Okay, Janice. I'll, I'll take sexist language here. Um, uh, I don't have any magic answers, but I think on this one, um, the first uh, and probably the best thing to do from my perspective is actually to call people on it. Um, but you have to be really careful about how you do it, particularly I would argue as a woman. You have to be careful how you do this uh, so that you actually are taken seriously as opposed to written off. And so um, you don't do it in the heat of the moment. You don't do it in front of other people. And you try to do it as constructively and as positively as possible. But sometimes people don't even know that they're doing it. Um, and if they do, um, I think, you know, a quiet word uh, privately about um, this is how it impacted on me, 
Um, I'm not sure what you meant by that. Um, I would prefer if you would, you know, not use that term or whatever. I think though, but with very, like, this is what you did, this is how it made me feel, and this is what I would like you to do instead. I think that's, um, that's one step at least in the, in the, in the direction that would, would deal with that. Thank you. Dorcas, can you take the last one? Yes, I'm probably the most obvious person to take it, so <laughs> I'm all good with that. Um, uh, I guess um, often, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a massive question. I mean, from, from my perspective, um, it's not really rocket science again. It's a simple acknowledgement that women and girls are people, and people don't pass in, this world, in the world in the same way that they face uh, different barriers and those barriers need to be removed. I think that sometimes um, the language of intersectionality when you're talking in the circles that um, uh, I walk in is, is scary for, for, for some people and uh, for, for some donors, but I think that's probably a perception that doesn't exist anymore. Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I, we're challenged all the time in terms of our funding um, applications to prove that we've reached certain groups of people, that we've taken certain things into account that weren't there um, when I started working in this sector a long time ago. So it doesn't seem like progress when you're on the outside, but the really boring things, the sort of conditionalities that donors place on us now force us to go further, force us to um, examine power relations within groups of women that we wouldn't have done otherwise. So I think, and that's thanks to like a lot of the demands coming from probably, let's be honest, like young women like you um, pushing this discussion and also um, various um, groups as well pushing this discussion. But there is a long way to go. And there is definitely a long way to go in the wider women's movement, but I'm not here speaking for them, so I'll speak for, for my particular bit and what I'm accountable for. But so, I mean, I don't have an argument with you because I agree with you, which you would expect, and I'm a little bit afraid of you. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we only have time for one more round. I know you had your hand very enthusiastically up, so I'm gonna take you, and then if I could take oh the God. man there, and um, the, oh, this is so hard, um, and, and the woman there in the second row. So here first, and then we'll take those two there. I know, I'm so sorry, if only we had more. Oh, I know, I know, oh. oh. Okay, okay. Um, Don't jump. <laughs> um, here, and then uh, if we could keep these brief, I'd be grateful. Yes, thank you very much. So my name is Caroline, and I'm a master's student here at LSE. So my question is from my personal experience when I've been working with uh, trafficked women in more rural parts of the world. And for example, in the Philippines, where who's also signed CEDAW, even though I try to, my plan, I will educate them about their rights. Came there, started doing that, among other things. It became very evident for me very quickly that one of the major problems is not only getting the legislation in place, making sure they are implemented. And how do we get that happening in the Philippines with 17,000 islands, for example, that's just one of the countries. How can we actually accomplish that part as well from the Western world? Thank you. Okay, and then I said I would take those two questions. Yeah, you first. Um, we, we were talking about, uh, sorry, I'm Sharon, I'm a master student here. <laughs> uh, we were talking about including women in, in the labor force, but I, I was wondering what we could do to include women in, in jobs that are not mainly seen as uh, like women jobs, because usually women get into the labor force in, in jobs that have to do with with care or care of young children, or even w when they do get into those jobs, the, you often see that the, I don't know, like many of the young uh, kids' teachers are women, but the headmaster is a, is a man. So how do we improve in, in this subtleties of labor market in women, inclusion Great. in women? Thank you. And then final question, you get the, the last word with the mic. Hi, I'm Will, I'm a student here. I was shown a piece of research recently which shows that across all countries, post-pregnancy, average wages between women and men shows a sharp divergence, mm -hmm. even in countries where legally they have kind of parity in parental leave. I was wondering what do you think are the root causes of this divergence and what policies can we enact to kind of target that? Thank you very much. Can we okay. go to the lady up there before she comes? To the yeah, okay. <laughs> go. Go. Right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, here at LSE as well. I'm from Brazil, and in Brazil, um, most, not, I don't like to use the word extremists, but the most radical feminists are called feminazis. 
Feminazis. I love it. Okay. So how can we really support it? Because it's not Thank you. men that call yeah. us feminazis, women do as well. Okay. So, <laughs> Super. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Okay. Um, so I'll turn to the panel. Um, I mean, I'm destroyed. Dorcas, do you want to start? I'll give you a choice of okay. these. Okay. All right. Um, well, I could do two very quickly. In terms of um, jobs that are not more traditional for women, I could quickly say, come to ActionAid and hear about our gender-just industrial policy, which we've been testing out with the Vietnamese government, and our gender and trade stuff, but then, you know, that's a plug. Um, but then uh, maybe femi-Nazis um, and radicalism. I guess you're kind of getting the sense that it's possible to um, be a bit radical. I count myself as a radical person, but still be able to talk in terms of other people's language because at the end of the day, um, you know, you can feel something very strongly, you can express it very strongly, but um, the greatest thing to do is to persuade people and bring people along with you. So, I mean, I can dial it up when I need to, and I can dial it down, but I never dial out. Um, so, um, and when you are in this um, situation of fighting for women's uh, rights, you know, you need to know when to shout, you need to know when shouting will harm, um, and you need to know when to both shout and persuade all at the same time. And it's always going to be take a back seat, go fast, go slow, take a back seat, go fast, go slow. I think this dichotomy between radicalism and then like, you know, insider stuff is like kind of redundant. I mean, that's not how we relate in terms of like um, um, a mass movement to convince people. But you can be radical inside and learn to talk in terms of other people's language and then when they don't do what you want, you then you dial up and you keep dialing up. And you have to win women's rights. This is a long battle, this is a generation thing 200 years from now women will still be fighting this sadly no, um, but you know <laughs> it's true it's I'm a gonna have to stop thing. you there <laughs> it's a long term thing but you need to have like the energy and the only thing about radicalism is like you know you can get very disappointed very quickly so you need to keep that fire burning um, that's that's all I would say but I wouldn't say that you know it's there's no place for radicalism because as you can see there's one sitting right in front of you and she's doing perfectly fine <laughs> thank you Okay, um, Janice. Okay, I um, we negotiated, and I'm going to do uh, uh, implementation of trafficking. Exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, acknowledge non-expert, but um, I'll point to three different things. First is I think that the funding of civil society organizations is an important uh, piece of this puzzle, so that there is there is a. Uh, an external view as to whether or not what's being said in legislation and what's what's in the rhetoric is actually translating to on the ground reality. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, donor countries uh, have a responsibility with for technical cooperation and technical assistance as well. Um, and so, you know, Canada has had a long track record of trying to help to build uh, law enforcement, prison guard capacity, those kinds of things where we're seeing that translation of legislative rights into action. Um, and But it doesn't just happen because you pass a piece of law. You actually have to train people to do those things and you have to show them the kinds of behaviors uh, with some accountability in terms of whether they're happening or not. Um, and I guess the last thing is uh, one of the dimensions of the, of, uh, of the Trudeau government's policy on feminist international assistance policy is this idea of uh, one of the thematics is around the role of women in peace and security. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to what extent can we explicitly support women to take on roles as peacekeepers, women in the security field? And I think if you look at uh, at the, um, you know, if we had better gender balance, perhaps in some of those uh, in some of those professions, you might just have a different sensitivity, a different awareness, and different capabilities. As as we build diversity into all aspects of our economic and social lives, we see that so too in the peace and security field. I would say. Thank you, Manish. Oh, and women, and men can be feminists too, right? Let's not forget it's not just women that are feminists. We can all be feminists. Just on the women, peace and security, but we of course have a centre here at the LSE that looks at women, peace and security issues. And um, 
and does a lot of time thinking about, you know, how do you have women, more women peacekeepers and that kind of thing, and how do you deal with violence in conflict zones? So it's very worth looking at their work. On the question on why do you get these divergences in wages, um, you know, I do think that it is declining over time. I was really pleased the other day, I was looking at the numbers for LSE graduates and LSE women graduates, uh, you know, 10% of them are earning, sorry, LSE total graduates, 10% are earning more than 100,000 pounds a year at the, after 10 years, which is extraordinary, and the women are exactly the same as the men, which I think is very interesting. So LSE women are doing incredibly well at competing with men at the top levels. But I think if you look at the evidence for the economy as a whole, the big divergence is really around having children. Um, and uh, where you see, uh, there was quite an interesting study which was published I think yesterday which looked at um, when women have children and what does that, that does to their wage expectations. That may be the one you're referring to, which showed that if you had children in your 20s, uh, you would suffer a wage gap that was very large, whereas if you had women and children in your 30s, the wage gap you would suffer would be less because you would be more well established in your career and in your 30s you'd be able to afford better childcare so you'd be able to go back to work more easily. Now that doesn't mean I'm saying postpone having children to your 30s. <laughs> you should have children whenever you like <laughs> is the answer. Um, but I think the public policy response is that is why good parental leave and good affordable high quality childcare is the answer. And if you can do that, I think we can close those gaps very easily. Thank you very much. Um, we are out of time. I'm not actually going to summarize, but I am going to ask each of the panelists to give, in 30 seconds, their one piece of advice um, to women and to feminists um, in the room and in the wider social media who are following us. What is the one piece of advice that you would offer so they could take this forward and help promote gender mm. equality. Um, Dorcas, are you moving your mic away or? <laughs> um, just don't give up. It's long. It's long. It really is. Um, but it's it's exciting, um, and um, I've seen a lot of progress in um, the the time I've been on this earth. You know, um, and I'm sure there's more to come. But you need to be really resilient. So try not to give up and try not to burn out. Thank you. Uh, Janice. If you don't do it, who will? Mm. Right. So look around this room and think, OK, so I'm not going to carry my part of this conversation. I'm going to expect somebody else to do it. Do it yourself. Mm. And don't be afraid to take risks. St you know, put your hand up, stick your neck out, take that assignment that looks a little bit difficult. Um, you know, write an essay when you're 17 called <laughs> A Feminist Strategy for the World. <laughs> Sometimes it might just work. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant advice. And I guess for what it's worth, my two cents worth, my advice is go and talk to men, other women, talk to people about this issue. I think when you talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, it's actually incredible um, how much you can have in common to, to communicate. So, um, and have them come and study, in econ study economics at LSC so they can learn <laughs> about loss aversion <laughs> and therefore they can overcome that. Um, but um, we are out of time. I know we didn't get to all of your questions. Your questions are absolutely fantastic. Um, I really appreciate you coming here tonight. Um, and I want to give, ask you to uh, join me in giving you a huge uh, round of applause to our fantastic panelists.